we will uh, <clears throat> uh, start with showing some uh, practical, which I already promised twice, but uh, I forgot. Uh, we will start with the complex exercise, which we use as a warm up exercise for um, our strength training sessions. It comprises of five different exercises with the bar. So the first exercise is down from the knees up to the chest. So start, down to starting position and up on your toe. That we will do six times and then all the way up on straight arms without stopping. All the way up in one movement. In one, no, in one movement. One movement. Okay. Then uh, we do squat and uh, push press. Squat and push press. Separate your, your feet. Squat and push press. Yeah, and push up. Up on your toes. And from there, exercise number four is good morning. Yeah, straight back, six times. And exercise number five is bent forward rowing. So each of these five exercises we repeat six, six times. So 30 repetitions total, continuous, uh, not, not explosive, um, controlled and continuous. Uh, it's a, a good warm up exercise for, um, for any other work for strength or power. Um, and this now two to three times, uh, normally two to three times, if, it's a good also to learning the technique then they can do three to four times otherwise uh, two to three times is enough for a, for a good warm so before this just a little uh, warm up raise the temperature four or five minutes a little dynamic exercises and then they can go directly with this exercise uh, kima we show some, some uh, common mistakes there wait wait, wait. i have to see you there you see, when you lift the bar, never, never lift with, with, the, with your back. So bend your knees, sit down, and lift from your legs. This, with the bar only, it's, it's maybe not that important if it's a little strong, but if you have weights on, this, this is very important. You, you can show again. Show again, so, so yeah. So we imagine we have a he heavy weight and then down and lift with the with the legs. Uh, yeah. So here you uh, turn sideways because they will not be able to see you. Here is important. You see here that the bar is in front of me, and the bar should go straight up behind your ears you can show a correct one there you see this position so we hold the bar in in, uh, in balance so we have the weight in between our, our uh, front and, and back yeah so the, the we, we start we show the starting position if you turn a little bit sideways so the starting position for clean and snatch and, and many exercises, this is the starting position where we have the, the shoulders in front of the knees of the yeah. and they go straight down to, to the floor. Show a, a wrong position where you sit down. So this is very common. This is very common that they put the knees forward and they sit down. Instead of pulling the knees back. And getting a good jumping position to be able to boom jump up the weight. You can show show a, a clean, a clean from starting position, and then jump up the weight in an explosive manner. Okay, so obviously this exercise is pretty technical, but we show you four four exercises which you can start with any kids and maybe not start with the bar, but start with a stick.
So one is the push press. You put the, the, the bar on the shoulders and push it up from the legs. Push up, push up, up on your toes. There. So the push press is an easy exercise. From then, we can go down in a squat, open, sit, sitting down, op open up your feet without falling forward, back as straight. From there, they can try overhead squat. They put the, the bar or the stick on straight arms, on straight arms, keep it there, keep it there. Straight arms, straight arms. Straight arms, keep them straight arms and go down. Yes. Overhead squat. And if you want to start with the first little explosive exercise, we start from the neck and we do a kick jerk from neck. Jump, jump up. There we have kick jerk from neck. So there are four simple exercises which are not too technical, which they can start with a stick to get familiar, then with the bar, and I ultimately a bar with some light weights and then with some medium weights and so on. We put some questions in the, in the group chat. We we'll try to answer. Meanwhile, we repeat the exercises. So as a little reminder. Okay, so we said the first one exercise push press. So from here, I push from from, uh, from the ground to get up on straight arms. Yeah. A slight push here, up on my toes, get the bar up. That's the good start exercise. Uh, the squat, they are open up a little bit, so much able to sit down. And here I will try to go down as low as possible. Here, and try to maintain my back as straight as possible. Here, to see balance without falling forward like this, but in a good line. And if they can do that, they can try. Straight arms. Now this is a little heavy because I have to warm up. But I'm the way to go. Sit down, lose my balance. And I have to keep something like this. And then we said the third exercise, little explosive uh, jerk from the uh, neck. So I keep the weight here. And then we jump up the weight. Get it up on straight arms. And if possible, I will try to sit down. Oh, like this. So now we have a good question. Yeah. So these are oh, no, these are some, some simple exercises which are not that difficult. The last one is is the most Technical with a little hand and foot coordination, but good exercise to start. We can this question. How long is the taper period? Uh, question How long is the taper period? I okay, it's a more. totally different subject. Uh, so it depends. If you have the possibility for a major competition, three weeks, three weeks um, uh, is the best. But that one, you can only do one or two times uh, per year. If you don't know your boxers, um, then you can do two weeks. So if you don't, you, you don't know um, <clears throat> the taper uh, boxers, usually two weeks. But if you if 
you have the possibility and know your boxers and most then you can have a good taper with three weeks and then if, if you have many competitions you do small tapers of one week of three two or three days with minor competitions no need to, to go for taper or, or long taper which one is good for making back strong well, yeah okay uh, which one exercise is good for making back strong so okay so um, this this exercise is very good the the squat overhead squat is a very good uh, core exercise um, back exercise where you work on on uh, trapezius or um, how you call this uh, um, uh, where you lift your uh, your upper body um, also good for for back i don't remember the name in english uh, Question from Ibrahim. If an athlete doesn't have. Uh, okay, oh, wait. Overhead squat. How far may the knees go past the toes? How deep do they bend? Okay, so this is a very common uh, mistake. Here in India, when they say that the knees should not go uh, in front of the toes, I say that's impossible. If I want to sit down, if I want to sit down, it's impossible. I don't go forward with the knees. So I want to sit down proper. Here, look, my knees have to go in front of the knees. Otherwise, I will pull backward. So I cannot think of trying to maintain my knees back, but I will use my balance. So I need to have my body, body weight lift forward, lift, lift, lift here. And for that, I need the knees to go forward. And I will try to sit down as deep as my flexibility allows me. So many people have problems come down because the flexibility is too bad. So, so the flexibility then we put, we put a small weight here to, to, to help them help them come down. And if you look at when people shoot they, they're they're very thick they have a uh, high uh, control so already when they start normal they are all up here, which helps them come down properly. Here. The toes, yes, it's the same. Same thing here. Another misunderstanding that the, the toes should point forward. If they point forward, it's difficult to maintain my balance. So I need to, number one, a little, little wider than the shoulders. I get my ass down and open up. A little bit here, so I can sit down comfortably. The important thing here is that the feet and the knees go in the same direction here. So this, this is very popular, <coughs> especially especially among girls who are not too so very strong. This can happen. Then you have to be careful. The knees and the feet in the same direction. That's also very important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I came for civil, civil today. Let's see if we can get Kevin here. Let me go. Okay, one, one more question. Question from Gyandra Sharma. Some or major plyometric and balance exercises just only for boxing, so that the boxer can convert his maximum strength to a specific strength like explosive and strength endurance. Oh, the specific, the, the specific, the specific is, is when we when we do boxing. That is the specific training. So when we when we punch, we move in in um, in, in fast, in explosive um, uh, movements. That is the specific. When we when we punch explosive punches on the bag, uh, maybe on the pads or or on, on school fight or sparring or, or, or competition, 
that is the specific. So when we when we talk about developing strength or developing power or developing endurance, uh, we do yes. We don't need to think about a specific boxing. We need to build a strong, explosive, and and fast boxer. And in the boxing training, there we do the specific training. Okay, Kevin. Okay, uh, so sorry for all the problems. Um, I'm going to talk today about a very important subject, uh, in my opinion, in combat sports in general, obviously in boxing also, uh, because we are talking about performance, but we are talking about health and we are actually talking about life. Because the situation is, uh, sorry, I will remove this. <laughs> this annotation uh, allowing a notation more um, disable and then okay um, okay done so so i'm going to talk about weight management in combat sports and especially how we approach it as, as a process as a system how we can optimize uh, the weight and the body composition to to get to protect health and to get the best performance possible. So, um, one thing we absolutely have to, 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 to know about making the weight is that the current practice all around the world that are very common, I know that you know that, uh, involve uh, dehydration. What I'm showing here is an article that has been published by some uh, medical doctors regarding a fatal case, which means that um, this, this guy here in this study uh, died because of the drastic weight cutting he did. And the, the, the disease was actually a rhabdomyolysis, which um, is uh, related to the destruction uh, of, of the muscles due to the lack of water. Um, so this is one threatening um, a situation and there is also hypothermia. Um, so I wanted to show you a little video. Obviously, I will try to share it, but if it doesn't work, I will not insist. Um, do you do you see what I'm I have on my screen right now? So I want to share this with you. Everybody see it now. Um, this this is a video. Of, yes, yes. Of an MMA fighter. As you can see on this video, she can barely stand up. She is in pain. She is struggling. This is not high performance. This is life threatening situation. If she perform in that stage, she can die because she's so much dehydrated. Yeah, you see, you see how, how much she is in pain right now. So I will not show the entire video, but obviously she is really in a bad, bad shape at the moment. Look, look at that. She can barely stand up. Okay, this is not high performance uh, in, my, in my opinion. So, I'm, I'm coming back to my presentation, but this is exactly what we should avoid to, to get the best performance and protect our athletes. So um, everything I'm gonna say today is basically to avoid that and then obviously also to, to improve high uh, performance. So how we can make it happen? First of all, it's important to know that in high performance, collaboration is essential. We need to have a plan and we need to talk to each other. And that's, that's how everything I'm going to say can happen. So, oh, okay. Uh, what is critical? So to have goals, whatever I'm going to say, if you don't have goals, if you, if you don't have assessment, you cannot, uh, you cannot, uh, actually plan it. So it's important to have goals and to plan according to the goals. 
Um, obviously, it's important also not to implement a technique. Uh, it's, it's valid for training. It's valid for, uh, for nutrition also. We need to know the rationale, why we are doing something. It's very important and we have to prioritize. You cannot do everything at the same time. In the situation I'm talking about right now, it's very, very important to have a simple assessment, which is gonna be the weight and the body composition with a skin fold caliper or an impedance meter, even if impedance meter is, is quite tricky due to that in regarding the hydration. But uh, um, so first of all, to do, to do this, you need a monitoring process. This monitoring process fits into a bigger picture. It's just an example here. I show you whatever we do for um, uh, the, 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 the health and performance of our female athletes. And as you can see, this is a system for female health, including a system for training load management, including a system for weight management. So whatever I'm gonna present today is here on the, top, on the bottom right, but obviously it fits in a bigger picture where everything is organized together. And that's the most important, uh, it's that everything fits together. So how does it work? First of all, we have a concept, I'm gonna explain it in details, which is safe, safe weight loss. To do this safe weight loss, obviously we need to evaluate, we need to assess the, the athletes. And then based on this assessment, we're gonna have a decision-making tree. And this will tell us what to do and when to do that, and all the actors, in, uh, all the collaborators involved in the process, uh, need to know whatever is going to happen. So the, the concept of safe weight loss, basically it starts from knowing what is the target weight. Okay, what, what we know is that we can quickly, by several techniques, we can quickly lose around 5% of our body weight without too much consequences. So this is the safe weight loss for acute weight loss, which means whatever you can lose in one week, okay? And you are not going to uh, put your life in danger. You can, we can go up to 8%, uh, but above 8%, we consider that if you do bad weight loss technique, above weight, 8% of your um, body weight, then you can put yourself in a major health risk. So this is the red flag. This is the red zone. You never want an athlete to, to fall in that category. If there is a bad planning of competitions and he has to lose more than 8%, then you never know. Your athletes may die because of those back technique of weight loss. So this is the red zone. You never want to go there. So then how does come from the, the, the safe weight loss concept? To know the safe weight loss concept, you need to know where you are at this point of time. Okay, let's say you are in the orange zone, which is the, the zone uh, we, we can accept in some period of the year, let's say the off season. So you could be uh, up, uh, something around 7% above your target weight. Okay, nice. And then now you start to use the assessment because you assess your players, Okay, and you know the body fat of your, of your athletes. Then you also have international standards. We know that in very small categories, you, are, you should be around 5 to 7% of body fat, where in heavyweight categories, you can go up to 12%. So you choose an optimal body fat according to, obviously, the, 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 the specificities of your athletes, but also according to his weight category. And then you calculate if he was at the optimal body fat percentage, what, what, what would be his weight with the exact same fat-free mass, muscle mass. And then you have a difference between the current weights. Let's say this athlete is 78 kg at 12% body fat. He could be at, because he's in middleweight, middle heavyweight category, he could be around 
8, 9% body fat, so 3% body fat. This 3% body fat is the safe weight loss he can do. So you know that around 3% of body, body weight can be loose. And this is your scope. What you want, obviously, is that the weight at optimal body fat should be lower than the zone where it's safe to lose acutely some weight with the technique uh, which belongs to the acute weight loss technique. So if this gray line is above the, the green one here, then it starts to be a problem because that means that the, the weight category chosen is not fitting the, 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 the possibilities of the athlete. So the athlete will, will have to put his health in, uh, at stack to make the weight. And that is a problem because if health is at stack, performance also. So what is the rationale to drop performance and health to actually fit into a category? There is strong assumption that anyway, he would have been more performance in a higher category. So this is the concept we are working with at IAS. And that's what we try to implement as much as possible with our athletes, always telling them what weight is optimal for them according to their current body composition. So based on this classification you see here on the left, we can categorize our, our athlete like this. And then depending on the situation, let's say the competition is, a, is a beyond four weeks or before four weeks or beyond six weeks or before six weeks, we can, we can decide what we should do. So this is a little bit big. So that's why I zoomed a little bit. Let's say your athlete in the, is in the green zone. So there is, there is no, no major issue. He can make the weight quite nicely without putting his life in danger. So obviously no intervention or you figure out that your athlete is actually a little bit fat. So why not do a chronic slow and progressive optimization of his body composition uh, and with a nutrition. Okay. And then when your athlete is in the last week before the, his competition, he can undergo some acute weight loss strategy by skipping some food like carbohydrates, food or things like that. If your athlete is in the orange zone, which happens very, very often in, uh, in combat sports, that's, that's the most common case. Then what we do here is if the, the competition is uh, beyond four weeks, then we can start a weight loss plan. If, if we can start the weight loss plan, it means that we, we diagnose that some fat can be loose. However, sometimes safe weight loss is not possible. So your athlete is actually 7% above the target weight. However, he's already very, very fit. So you need to have a team, a team meeting to decide if the category, the weight category need to be changed. However, if, if the fat can be loose, okay, let's go for a progressive weight loss plan. And then close to the competition, you can do acute weight loss. If you have less than four weeks, then either you can lose fat and you go for an aggressive weight loss plan because you have four weeks. And then after this aggressive plan, you go for acute weight loss strategy the last week. But if there is no fat to lose, then what, what, what we do? Again, a team meeting is necessary to decide. Do we have to change the weight category? Do we have to cancel the competition? So this needs to happen. Worst case scenario, you are in the 8% zone. Again, same system. If you have more than six weeks, of, why six weeks and not four weeks like before? Obviously, because the more you have, you are overweight, the more time you need, you need to, to drop the weight if it's possible. So safe weight loss is possible, no, then definitely you need to, uh, to think about weight category change. 
you have less than six weeks, competition cancellation by category change. That's the same system. If you have less than six weeks and you can lose fat, then you have to undergo an aggressive weight loss plan during six weeks and then acute weight loss. What I'm talking about when I'm, I'm talking about progressive weight loss and aggressive weight loss is a difference in the, in the composition of the diet. There is a lot of, of, of scientific studies now that studied especially the protein intake. I'm gonna talk about that. And that's, that's where we can actually manage the diet of our athletes. The more you go, the more you, you decrease the caloric intake, the more you, you need to increase the protein intake to keep the muscle mass and keep the immune system function in, in a good function for your athletes and keep the sleep, all the, the bad effect of weight loss. You try to protect your athletes from that with higher protein intake. Has to be optimized, however. So the first priority for us is to keep our athlete within 5% in the green zone. Um, uh, so 5% uh, from the target weight. How we do that? We have an athlete management software. And in that ma athlete management software, every week or every second week, our athletes are weighted in a standard situation, which is before training, okay? Uh, before breakfast, before training. In that situation, one time a week, the athletes are classified. And so as you can see, they are falling into red zone, orange zone, or green zone. This is a system we put in place with H10. So this tells us in the blink of an eye, which athletes need to be addressed to a nutritionist, which athlete we need to talk about with the coach, with the SNC, to know whatever we have to do. So how we, how we paradise? Know that we have a system, we know, um, whatever we do, how, how we should organize our periodization. First of all, what can be periodized? Okay, because we talk about periodization, but all the time for training. But the reality is different. We can periodize training, we can periodize recovery, we can periodize nutrition, that's what I'm talking about today. We can periodize psychological skills and we can periodize technical skills. So everything basically can be periodized. And if you do well, you periodize everything together so that it makes sense and it's, it's periodized according to your goal. What could, what could look like weight periodization? So obviously the more tolerance you have is during the off season. You have an acceptable weight gain. It should be limited, but okay. You adapt the, the energy, uh, the energetic intake to the energy requirements. So basically you decrease a little bit the energy, energetic intake. Then you go in the, in most of the year you are in the weight maintenance phase. Uh, okay, you optimize the nutrition uh, in according to the training. So what you want is just the athletes to perform. At every single session, you want the athletes to perform. If you have a scope for body composition optimization, you're gonna do it progressively and slowly. Then you have the weight loss phase. This, this phase is a little bit different because then body composition is important. It's one of the priorities. So sometimes the training needs to be adapted also according to the fact that you are um, decreasing the caloric intake. So you are a little bit more prone to fatigue and you have a little bit uh, less good recovery. Uh, this is the moment also you can start, for example, some uh, potential ergogenic supplementation like beta-alanine. And you need a training load management system to, to, to tightly regulate whatever you do with your athletes in that specific situation. Then there is the rapid weight loss. The acute weight loss is the moment where you follow a very specific techniques to drop very quickly weight. During the weight loss phase, what you want is to drop fat. During the rapid weight loss, the last week, you don't drop fat. It's not the moment, it's too late. What you drop is glycogen, sco glycogen store. You decrease the content of the intestine. So it's like more fat-free mass. It's actually your muscle mass or your, your water, which is dropping, or your energy store. 
but it's very different. You are not dropping fat at that moment. So usually you are in the tapering phase. I hear the Santiago talked about the tapering phase. So tapering phase often one, two weeks before the competition. So these acute weight loss strategies, they fall into that tapering phase. At that moment, <coughs> you continue, if you are under a specific uh, ergogenic supplementation, you're gonna continue it. Then you, then you, you start the competition phase. Then you, come, you just come from the acute weight loss phase, so you're gonna recover, recover aggressively. And what you want is to bring back as much water and glycogen store, carbohydrate, carbohydrate store in your, in your muscle as you can. And sometimes you can use uh, some other ergogenic supplements like caffeine acutely to improve your performance and decrease the fatigue. So this is the cycle where uh, um, an athlete uh, in combat sport should go through according to, um, to the phase of, 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 of the year and according to his need uh, in terms of his weight. In, in boxing, there is one specific thing is that you give the weight potentially every day. So the rapid weight loss technique and competition phase can be paradised on a daily basis during the competition. That's exactly what we did with Nikat Zarin for uh, the national championship in 2018, where she, <coughs> she made all this within five months. And then daily, on a daily basis, she was losing weight recovering in the morning and then losing weight in the evening again and again and again like that until the end of the competition so this is very specific to boxing how does it look like the same period the same phases what what we have first we have the weight so how does it look like off season we obviously have a little gain of weight um weight maintenance either we keep it or sometimes we drop slowly but most of the time, we can keep it like that. Okay, and then you go in the weight loss period. You drop weight quickly. Then at the last period, acute weight loss, you continue to drop weight. And then because of the recovery techniques you use, you bring back some weight just before the bout. Okay, but now this is just weight. This doesn't tell you whatever you gain or lo lost. Let's talk about fat mass now. What, what we should do, we have a gain in fat mass during off season. During the weight maintenance phase or slow weight loss phase, you drop progressively some fat. Then you enter the weight loss phase where you want to drop fat as much as you can. During the acute weight loss phase in the last one week before the competition, at that time, you don't lose fat mass anymore. And during the competition phase, also your fat mass will remain the same. This is a very short timeline. You cannot, you cannot change fat mass during such a short timeline. However, fat-free mass is different. So fat-free mass, how does it should look like? Fat-free mass during the off-season, if you do well, it will not change. If you do bad, it will drop. In the weight maintenance, you train a lot, so most of the time, you gain some muscle mass. During the weight loss, the goal is to maintain muscle mass. It's not anymore the time where you're gonna, get, you're gonna gain so much strength and power. So you just try to keep the ability where they are and the, body, and the muscle mass where they are. At the moment of the acute weight loss, because you manipulate the water, the glycogen store, the carbohydrate store, the, the content of the, of the intestine, at that moment, you lose fat-free mass. And that's why you lose weight, actually. So during this, this phase, you lose weight because you lose ma fat mass. And then you continue to lose weight because you lose fat-free mass. But this, if you manage well, because of the recovery techniques, you can quickly put on fat-free mass, you recover your water, you recover your glycogen store, and then you compete actually two, three kg above the weight category. So this is how we try to manage and to optimize the performance and the health of the athletes through good the year, through good their periodization. So weight maintenance, what you want? <coughs> you assess regularly the, the athletes 
and you set some body composition goal. That's the moment also you ask yourself what is the best weight category possible. That's where we come back to the safe weight loss concept. Uh, usually in that phase, it's a slow and progressive decrease uh, in, in fat. And if, if necessary, a progressive increase uh, in fat-free mass. Obviously, your main goal with the nutrition is to optimize the training quality and periodize the nutrition according to the training goals. Let's say you want more endurance, you can do some kind of fast training in the in, in before the breakfast or something like that be, because you want specifically to train your your endurance. So those are advanced techniques which are not the subject of today, but many things are possible to optimize uh, training quality. Then you enter the weight loss plan. So the weight loss plan, I wanted to show you this recent uh, um, <coughs> review, which show that, okay, um, the normal amount of, of, of protein uh, uh, an active person is taking is 0 0.8 to one gram per kg, right? For weight maintenance, which, which is for most of the athletes, the normal amount of protein they need for recovery, for adaptation, 1.3 to 1.6, even up to two grams per kg of, of, of protein. But recently we discovered that most probably we need higher amount of protein beyond the normal amount of protein during the weight loss period because it gives many recovery advantage, sleep advantage. It's also, it's switch off the hunger. It limit the hunger, it increase the satiety and it, it protect the muscle mass. So that's why in the weight loss period, we're gonna go for higher protein intake. So we create a caloric deficit during the weight loss period. Uh, the higher the caloric deficit, the higher the protein intake should be. Sometimes because you drop so much the calorie, multivitamin and fish oil supplements could be useful to make sure that you have the essential fatty acids and the essential vitamins and minerals. Also, what something I really like to do is one, one of the, 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 the nutritional techniques to, to increase recovery is the pre-sleep protein snack. So basically you're gonna take either protein from food or protein from protein powder like whey. You're gonna take 20 to 60 grams depending on your body size just before going to bed, 30 minutes before going to bed. And this is really helpful. I have many, many athletes on hard diet plan, high weight, very hard diet uh, weight loss plan. When they take that, they actually sleep really better. So this is the kind of strategy you can put in place during a weight loss plan. The harder the weight loss plan is, uh, the more you need multivitamin fish oil, the more you need more protein, the more you need the pre-sleep the, the pre, pre protein snack. How does it look like? For example, so here is an athlete who was losing weight, um, just a little banana before the morning break, the, the morning training to make sure that there is some carbohydrates and he, his immune system is not too much stressed by the morning training. Then breakfast is actually some kind of normal with one slice of bread three boiled egg, glass of milk, a serving of fruit. So some kind of carbohydrates in the, in the breakfast, a little bit of peanut butter. So you see the breakfast is not that, that hot. However, from the lunch, we are only on vegetable with no fat, no ghee, uh, three, four pieces of, of chicken. Okay, we can use paneer, but if you use paneer, then you have to choose a low fat paneer. Uh, in the afternoon, two glasses of curd. So as you see, it, uh, it's, it's only protein mainly. Um, so this is our protein snack of the afternoon. Then at dinner with two N would be better. However, uh, vegetable, low fat serving, basically it's the same than, than the lunch. So low fat, big serving of vegetable, three, four pieces of low fat chicken or low fat paneer. And then before bed, because it's a young athlete, I wasn't use, uh, using uh, uh, whey protein, so just two glasses of uh, milk before going to bed uh, in the, in, at night. So that was to optimize for his weight loss plan. So as you can see, it's quite hard. 
plenty of vegetable, plenty of protein, but not so much of carbohydrates and not so much of fat. So very low carb uh, caloric intake. <coughs> then from this period where you actually lost some fat, you go into the weight loss strategy, acute weight loss strategy. So this, this is not any more fat you target. What you want is in kind of drying the body from his energy store to lose one, two kg, and then decreasing uh, the content of the intestine. And then potentially, sometimes you go for dehydration, but this is the last option because here is the risk, uh, the life threatening risk. Okay, so first option is low carb, low carbohydrates. So how you do that? Basically, you suppress uh, most of the food rich in carbohydrates, fruits, grains, bread, juice. However, this comes with consequences. You have an increase in fatigue, you have a decrease in ability to repeat high intensity effort, so you have to plan your training accordingly. You have some hunger, you crave for sweets, you really want to eat sugars because your brain is just not happy, actually very upset and asks you to give some sugar. And then sometimes you have sleep disturbances. To recover from that specific strategy, it's high, very high intake of carbohydrates, uh, around one gram per kg of carbohydrates every three, four hours. Actually, my technique is every, uh, is every two hours to make sure that we do everything in the morning. And if you want to store carbohydrates in your muscle and your liver, you will need water also. So this is the low glycogen store technique. I drop the glycogen store of my muscle and liver. Then the second option is starting to decrease um, the residue in your intestine. So the low carbohydrate diet was actually starting one week before the competition. While this low residue diet, you can start it only one or two days before the competition, before the weighting. Okay, at that time you reduce vegetable, you increase protein, you, inc you decrease fruits, nuts, everything that is rich in fibers, basically you kick it out. You reduce global food intake. What you want is actually that there is little, little, little byproduct of food in your intestine. So it doesn't keep water, it doesn't keep fibers, and you basically have very small amount of uh, food residues in your intestine. However, it can increase your hunger, it can increase your constipation, and somehow a little bit your fatigue. To recover from that, you have to be really careful because if you did a really, really strict low residue diet, then you may have to uh, resume fibers from fruit and vegetable progressively. That's the only view, because if you resume it too fast, your intestine could be upset. And the last option, is the hydration. The, 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 the dehydration technique that we absolutely want to avoid is passive sweating, like sauna, because sauna is specifically uh, impacting on, on the plasma, so the water of the blood. Why, when, you, when, you restrict, uh, when you restrict your, your hydration, your, your drinking, then it's a little bit different. It's not so much the plasma which is reduced. So the first option is to reduce, flu uh, the, to reduce drinking. And the second op option is to simply do more exercise which active sweat, with active sweating. The last option which personally I decided to not use ever is sweating jacket and sauna because this is what bear the, the, the highest risk of hyperthermia, rhabdomyolysis. So, and this, and some kind of heat illness, actually, if we talk about that, and this is, there is a fatal risk. So this dehydration techniques is, I limit my approach to fluid restriction if really, 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 we are so close to the weight and there is no option to go in a higher category. So I, des I described to you all the rapid weight loss strategy. And then when you underwent that, how do you recover from that? The priorities to recover from the acute weight loss strategies are refueling and rehydrating. 
carbohydrates, water, and electrolytes, electrolytes. Carbohydrate in huge quantity, water accordingly. So if you, if you take 150 or 200 grams of carbohydrate, you will need one liter or two liter of water with it. And you make sure that you take sodium and potassium uh, also with it to equilibrate the electrolyte balance of your body. At the moment of the recovery, after the waiting, protein are not necessary. That's not the priority. That was before. At the moment after waiting, you don't have to take whey. You take it after the bout. But right now after waiting, it's not necessary. Obviously, you have to avoid fatty foods, junk foods like chocolates uh, or whatever food you can imagine. I, I know the athletes were star was starving before. He wants to eat whatever he wants, but it's actually detrimental for his performance. So he should focus on things like fruits, juice, banana, bread, biscuits. Those things are good. How does it look like? For example, no drinks, no food before the waiting. Immediately after the waiting, one liter of sport drinks or one liter of juice, two, three banana, two, three slices of bread, one, two cup of black coffee. Why black coffee? Because there is caffeine. And caffeine is potentially uh, uh, increasing performance uh, during the bout that is coming. One hour and a half or two hours after, the, after this first snack, you can repeat a little bit less, but still spot drinks or, or juice and then banana, slice of bread, one, two cup of coffee. Okay, so this will increase the carbohydrate, we increase the water, help recover the glycogen score and provide the caffeine which can help in the first bout. And then before bouts, we can go for only sport drinks or juice. If there is really, really high space between bouts, like in boxing, if there is, um, if there is really big time, it's, and the next bout is the next day, then you will have to cycle and resume the weight loss technique, the acute weight loss technique, which is very specific to boxing. So basically you will have only the time before the, the bout to recover, and then you will have to switch, to switch back to the technique you used in the days before the weight in. So what you should do is in, in general is eat according to the needs adapt hydration according to the weight loss during practice and manage your weight over time as per the global plan I gave you. What you shouldn't do is check the weight after practice because you only assess a body with, which uh, just lost some water. And you shouldn't, do, shouldn't skip meals. I've seen that so many times at IAS athletes uh, not going to lunch, not going to snack, only eating two meals a day. If you don't eat at the moment you want to lose weight, you will not lose weight because the body is already in resistance to the weight loss. So it's important to meet your energy requirements and then you can start a weight loss from that period. Don't think that an athlete who is eating a lot is necessarily fat and overweight. Training requires energy, requires nutrients. The, the more you train, the more you need food. And it's a healthy cycle. At the moment you start the weight loss, if the athlete wasn't eating enough before, he will not lose weight properly. Increase weighting voluntarily, obviously fall into the dehydration techniques and it's really not what I, I advise to do. Practical examples now just to finish. So I give you this, to, this, you can see clearly there is two patterns here. So this athlete has a weight maintenance, which was actually a little weight gain because it's a young athlete who was 17 at that time, uh, increasing progressively his weight and then dropping quickly. You see the weight loss phase like that, a little slowdown and then up to approximately two weeks after this, this weight assessment, because he left IAS at that time, he was doing the competition. Then he came back, he came back at that weight. The weight maintenance phase, because of the, of the, of the growth, this weight maintenance phase is actually not a weight maintenance phase. So he reached this very high weight and then drop again to go in the 63 uh, category. But because of this, 
we had a couple of discussion with this athlete to say you need to go in a higher category because now because you prove you are not going to to make it uh, because this athlete was also very very fit so he was basically here at at around nine percent body fat and here he was at six percent body fat <coughs> as you can see during the process there is not a perfect maintenance of the fat free mass the muscle mass the muscle mass also is dropping obviously a little bit less than uh, than the weight but still you have a drop in fat mass and then you recover your your, fat, your sorry the, the fat free mass you recover a little bit of it but not like before and then again again in, in fat free mass and then again lose so even with the best nutritional strategy, you cannot expect to completely keep the muscle mass if you go for a very, very hard diet. So this was an example of, of uh, a boy. And here is the example of Nika Zarin uh, in 2018. As you can see, we monitored most of the parameters, uh, fat percentage, uh, fat, fat, global fat mass, weight, and uh, the difference with the target weight uh, in kg so as you can see the progressive decrease here right and progressive decrease in fat mass also with uh, obviously in the last period the drop of the weight is is uh, is the highest so it's also the moment where the the plan was the hardest and where the the the, the fat the fat loss was the, the, the highest however look look at here i didn't put the, the the fat free mass here but obviously in the last last moment the fat free mass dropped a lot so we didn't drop so much fat the last week we actually lo uh, lost most most of uh, most of the weight loss was uh, as muscle mass um thanks very thank you very much uh i hope this was not too long and um, if there is some question i would be very happy to answer okay let's see if we have some questions uh, from ibrahim and salak during the bout which drink can we give to improve recovery that that i can answer during the bout we can we are only allowed to give water during the bout we can only give water and we cannot not even bring our water but we will get the water bottle uh, at the ring or, 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 or before. There was a, a big um, discussion many years ago in professional boxing when, when um, box, uh, coaches were st starting to give um, Gatorade and, and um, other, other um, of these uh, energy drinks. Um, and, and they allowed in, in some organizations. Uh, Kevin, do you have any, any comment on that? Don't they fight longer about 12 rounds? Does it make sense to get something with electrolytes? Uh, um, in, in, in the boxing duration, even professional duration, it's not endurance. So um, basically the recommendation up to 75 minutes are that carbohydrate will not help as a fuel. However, there could be an effect because you have some very specific sensor in the mouse and in the mouse is per, uh, perceiving, uh, percepting uh, the carbohydrate and, and just because of the feedback on the brain, you can have a little, a little uh, performance effect. So basically, when you, when you take carbohydrate during, during practice or uh, during a very long bout, like in professional boxing, it can help, but it will help because you rinse your mouth with the carbohydrates, not because you swallow it. So in our boxing, we don't have that problem during the bout because we can only take water. Yeah, in amateur boxing, particularly if you want the, you want the effect, mostly I would say it's before because it's very short. It's before, so 15 minutes or five minutes before the bout, you can actually rinse the mouth, and then it should it should make the effect for the entire duration of the bout. Um, B. Bin Jassib, uh, this is a very general question. Sir, my student is now 59. He is to play 56. How can I manage his weight? Uh, just like I explained. <laughs> so basically what, what you need to know now is first his age. First of all, his age. Because an athlete which is growing, 
you want him to be fit, obviously you don't want a nobis or overweight, very fat uh, boxer. That, that, that makes sense. You want a, a, fit cha a, a fit adolescent or whatever. But you don't drop weight. You don't do this kind of very advanced technique with a young boxer. Because if you stunt his bruise, that's actually bad for his performance. So we need to have bigger plan for our athletes and make sure that we want them to perform at senior level. If he's at senior level or late stage of junior level, then we can start to, uh, to, to, to go into something very uh, advanced. And at that time, you need first to assess, okay, weight is not the answer. What is the answer is what is the fat percentage? And if the fat percentage in that, that weight, the fat percentage should be seven, seven, eight percent at the moment of the bout, maximum. In, in, I mean, in world championship or Olympic championship, it's gonna be that or even lower. So at that time, you need to assess. If your athlete is searching for some body fat, then he needs to, to see a nutritionist, drop it to below 10%. He's gonna train at nine or 10% body fat. At the moment he make the weight, he's gonna drop even more to seven, eight percent and make the weight. Okay, let me see, from Vimal Singh. Sir, the diet will remain the same during weight loss because in India, the weather conditions are very different in North and South. North is cold and South is a little hotter than North. So basically what, what is important is, is to individualize the hydration. If you, if you train in hot weather, you need to know that you will sweat more. So you have to re, uh, provide more water. That is the first element. Second element is about periodization. So if, if you know that your athletes, wherever he trains, you're gonna perform in, in hot weather. You, you know that you're gonna go in a country where it's hot. So that you need to anticipate months before and maybe do some kind of uh, mesocycle of heat acclimatation. And during that heat acclimatation, you need to know that he gonna perform better in, in heat. However, he gonna put on a little half or one kg of water in the, in the blood because of heat, this acclimation. So he needs to monitor the weight carefully, drop a little bit the fat because he gonna increase the, the water in his body. So it's, it's about assessment, anticipating where he's gonna perform. And obviously during the time of the training, you make sure that he's well hydrated. Uh, okay, uh, Ramadar, how many weeks before competition should, should an athlete start weight loss program? So that I put, that I, I put it in the, in, the, in the program. So for me, uh, it's the, it depends on the percentage above the weight. So basically, for me, uh, uh, um, an athlete is permanently, uh, uh, an athlete in combat sport is permanently trying to optimize. So if you're gonna perform at 7% body fat, you know that during the weight maintenance phase, during the training phase, where you try to increase your, uh, your physical qualities, you should be around nine. You cannot drop from 15 and go to seven. It's not possible. So you need to, to maintain and to prepare to be, to be close, nine, 10% maximum. And then, depending on, on how much weight you are, you, you need to anticipate. If you are, let's say, at 11% or 12% body fat, okay, six weeks before the competition and you are in the red zone. So you need to start now, six to eight weeks before. You need to start. What, what uh, Nikat is a very good example. She was coming back from injuries, from an injury. So she came in September for December. And she has been clever because in between she went back home, she gained a little bit of weight, but it's okay. Because she has taken so much time, she has anticipated so much, she could, have, she cannot, she, she could afford to, re, to regain a little bit of fat in the middle and then, and then drop again. Uh, if, you, if you wake up two, three weeks before, it, it's too late. So six to, six to eight weeks is actually the time to, to, to drop something like three, four, uh, percent of your of your um, body weight, okay. Eight percent, eight, eight percent. You you will need, uh, yeah. You you will need to drop three four percent during the, the this period, and then you go for acute weight loss. And the last the last week, you're gonna drop two three percent, and then you're gonna globally make it. But again, it it depends on the body composition of your athletes. If your athletes has a lot of fat to lose. You, need, you, you will need a lot of time. 
if your athlete is only uh, needs only acute acute solution, then you're gonna manage everything very close to the competition. <coughs> okay, we take last two questions uh, from Gula Mustafa. I have a boxer; his weight is not gain. So, what what I do? Gain his weight approximately approximately six kilos. He wants to go up in weight. Yeah. The, the, the first point is it, it shouldn't be fat because there is no advantage to gain fat. Maybe, maybe in, the, in the belief, it's like if, I'm, if I'm heavier, I'm stronger, but it's not the case. Whatever you gain in fat, you don't gain anything in strength and you lose it in stamina, in endurance and in quickness of, of, of uh, in the movement or injury. So there is only one solution for gaining weight. It's to gain uh, muscle mass and strength. Because he, if, he, if he do a lot of hypertrophy without heavy weight, he's going to gain muscle, but that's going to be heavy and non-functional also. So the only good solution is actually to start a paradise program with hypertrophy, strength, hypertrophy, strength, so that you make sure that you increase strength as much as you increase weight to make sure that the functional ability of the player is the same. Obviously, nutrition will help. As soon as the training is planned, then the nutrition should be planned accordingly with the right amount of calories, the right amount of protein, uh, and everything else, and, and a regular assessment to make sure that he's not putting on fat, but he's putting on muscle mass, and also some, some kind of testing to make sure that functionality is improving as much as the weight. Yeah, I would say um, very difficult to, to increase six kilos. If it is a lightweight, then he should box in, in, a, in a lighter weight category, number one. If it is probably, <laughs> he's talking about a heavier weight boxer, but uh, like you said, Kevin, uh, we cannot focus on the weight. Let's say 181 kilo who jumps up to 91 and he's on 85. So the, the, the weight in itself, we have to train, train up a little extra, more, more strength training, but he can box 85, 86, 87, and box in 91 kilo. Just because he reaches the weight, 91 kilo, with, with a lot of fat, will not make him a better boxer. Yeah. Okay, la last question. Raman, uh, boxing is a game that is completely dependent on specific weight but it is always advised weight control should be discouraged to young children. In this regard, I would like to know what would be the specific age for maintaining weight? So the, basically what, what is advised is to, it's to record the rules of the athlete. So you, you, you need to assess the peak height velocity, know when your athlete is growing because you can take two boys and you will have one boy still growing up very fast at 16 and another it's finished at 13. so in lightweight in very small weight category often it's boxers who grew up very early and they don't grow up very late uh, while in heavyweight category those guys are very tall so they they, they, they tend to to grow very late in in age but well, that's a general uh, what, what you need to know is that the, 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 the bruise is finished. You don't reduce drastically the energetic intake of, a, of an athlete uh, during the bruise. So you, you wait to, 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 to actually do some aggressive weight loss. You just wait that the, the height is rich. And at that time, you can start those kind of periodization. And, and, but yeah, generally, I had that question, for example, in, a, in another training center, uh, which report many, many young uh, boxers with, uh, with their growth stunt. This is a big problem. You cannot make a champion if you stop the, the growth in the middle of, uh, of the development. This, this is just um, acute performance. You make a, maybe a national champion, but you're not going to make a, a senior champion. You, you just have to let them grow. And then when it's finished, then you can start. That means you have to assess your athlete. That's monitoring. Yeah, I, uh, I want to say that from, it, from my own experience, um, many, many kids, they copy the adults. They, they see, they see the, oh, the, this uh, champion is putting on the sweatsuit, so he's going to the sauna, so 
sure they want to do the same. They are 12, 13, and they, they, they don't understand the consequences, and the coaches don't understand the, the consequences. So here, we need to guide them to, to a healthy relationship to, to, to the weight management, and they will grow. They will grow. As long as they, they grow, we cannot stop their, their growing. Okay, I think questions are, re are re repeating. And time is, is, is running. Okay, we will continue tomorrow. We have uh, Colonel uh, Ashok about uh, some refereeing, some, some judging referee. Um, Kevin, thank you so much. Great, uh, great um, lecture. And um, we will put the presentation in, um, in the BFI web website so you, you can uh, have it from there. Uh, and we see you everybody tomorrow. Thank you very much.